This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Well, from chapters four through to chapter eight, what we've been looking at is the unincorporated trader, i.e. the self-employed individual. Now, the self-employed taxpayer could either be a sole trader or, of course, could be a partner within a partnership. And we've seen the exercises that need to be done. How is it that we compute the tax-adjusted trading profit of either the sole trader or the partnership? And how then, if it's a partnership, do we divide out that tax-adjusted trading profit between the partners? And also then, having got the tax-adjusted trading profit for each sole trader or for each partner within a partnership, how do we then determine how much profit, which profit, should be assessed in each relevant tax year of assessment to know what will go to each income tax computation, primarily, of course, for us in terms of our exams, the 21-22 tax year there. Chapter 4 and Chapter 5, as we know, established how to compute the tax-adjusted trading profit. And that's true whether it's sole trader or a partnership that we're dealing with. Chapter 6 showed us how to deal with individuals in terms of working the assessments in both opening years, continuing years of an unincorporated trade, and then the closing years of that the trade, the cessation of trading. Of course, it wasn't always a profit that we were dealing with. And in Chapter 7, we looked at what we could do with a tax-adjusted trading loss. If it arose for an accounting period, how then would we deal with it? We saw that there would be a nil assessment arising for the tax year of assessment, but then a variety of different reliefs that either the sole trader or the partner in a partnership with his or her share of the tax adjusted trading loss, what exactly they could do with it as regards the available reliefs. What we now turn our attention to here in Chapter 9 is looking not at the self-employed, but the employed. We're looking at employment income here. And as it was with the unincorporated trader, much of what we need to know for the 21-22 tax year, here under Finance Act 21, has not changed since earlier years. And what that will allow us to do, and I'm going to run you through it here for Chapter 9, will be able to use some, but not all, of the Finance Act 2020 lectures. So I need you to take a note now of what it is we'll be able to utilise from FA 2020 and where it will be used, and then what differences within that material, small differences, we may find. If there are very small differences, as we will see in a moment's time, then again, it is perfectly fine to use the FA 2020 lecture with me pointing out, ah, this percentage should be that instead of that. That's not a reason to re-record an entire lecture. But some of the lectures where there's been substantive computational change, not in terms of the principles that we apply, just the numbers that we use, it would be very difficult to get your head around answers to the examples within the text based on Finance Act 20, when it's somewhat different in terms of the numbers that we'll have for Finance Act 21. So some of these lectures have been newly recorded specifically for the Finance Act of 2021, where those numerical changes have occurred. And as we'll discover, as was the case with capital allowances, where we had to do a lot of new recordings, it's basically to do with cars. Not this time capital allowances, as it was in Chapter 5 for the unincorporated trader, but now to deal with assessable benefits in terms of a employee being provided with what we would loosely call a company car, but a car provided by their employer. And again, what has happened over recent years, there have been changes in as much as we have to have lower and lower CO2 emissions to get the least assessable benefit. And the percentages and the CO2 emissions that we were using in last year are not now the same for this year. Now, don't worry, because there's a lot of percentages and a lot of different CO2 emissions. But just like with capital allowances, where we had the problem there for dealing with cars and their emissions, 
uh, the rate, sack rates and allowances information available to you in the exam provides all the stuff that would otherwise be a nightmare in terms of a learning exercise. All you, we've got to show you within these lectures is how to apply those particular rules in terms of the rates and allowances that are given to us. So, in chapter 9, therefore, firstly, lecture 9.1 here. Now, that one is last year's lecture intact. That is what will follow on, indeed, from this introduction now. So it uses the FA 2020 lecture, which continues to remain valid for the 21-22 tax year. It shows you to begin with how to differentiate between what constitutes employment from what constitutes self-employment, because there are very different bases of assessment when dealing with the employed as compared to the self-employed. What we also have to look at with employment income is not only do we include income, but there are certain expenses that may be allowable expenses, allowable deductions from our employment income in establishing the net employment income to include within the income tax computation, as we saw back where we started in Chapter 2, where we put together that pro forma income tax computation. Then I just gave you an employment income assessment. What we've got to do in this chapter is to see how we find that. One part of it, which we begin to look at within this first lecture, is dealing with allowable deductions for whatever the employment income, the salary, the wage, the bonus, the benefits assessable. What that uh, deduct, those allowable deductions might be. What is allowable as compared to what isn't. But then, of course, we have to look at the top line, the employment income itself, prior to those deductions. Now, we know that what would employment income be? Basically, your annual salary there. That's what it would be. We need a basis of assessment, and it, to begin with, is straightforward enough. It's the only logical one we would use. What was actually received in our tax year for us now, 21-22 tax year? What was actually received? But what we also discovered, and why it takes us more time in this particular lecture to deal with it, is that there are a range of benefits that an employer, if they were so minded, might provide an employee with. Surprisingly, there's quite a number of exempt benefits. It's quite a long list, as you'll see uh, later in these lectures, though the amounts involved tend on the most part not to constitute very much. But there are exempt benefits. And then, of course, there are assessable benefits, the one that you need to know how to compute and therefore bring in to that employment income assessment. And that's what most of our lectures here in Chapter 9 deal with. But to begin with, chapter, uh, sorry, Lecture 9.1, the first of the lectures, is just the old lecture. As 2 is 9.2, but I must point out, yes, we use the FA 2020 lecture, where the only change in the Finance Act 2021 is, as I was talking about a moment ago, a percentage that will now be dealing with the 21-22 tax year instead of 2021, where, and this is the reference in terms of your study note, in section 7.1, Part B, Note 3 of the study notes. The official rate of interest, ORI there, the official rate of interest, a figure that is again provided to you on your rates and allowances page, that is now 2% for our 21-22 tax year. Now, the use of the official rate of interest comes in to that second lecture. It's part of working out what an assessable benefit might be for an employee who is allowed the use of employer-owned living accommodation. If your employer provides you with living accommodation, again, <laughs> good if we can get that, if that happens, there is clearly going to be, in most cases anyway, an assessable benefit. And in one of the parts of that computation, we need to know the official rate of interest. Well, for 21-22, as I've said, and in your 
FA 2021 study notes, you will find that that shown is correctly 2%. Whereas in the lecture where the computation in the example 2 is used in example 2 there, but in the lecture it's dealing with the 2021 tax year rather than the now 21-22 tax year that affects you. And back in 2021, it was 2.25%. So all we've got to be aware of is where, when I go through that question and answer, that example and answer with you, that uh, we would be in the lecture using 2.25%. You'll be substituting the correct official rate of interest for our tax year. That is 2%. Same applies in lecture 9.3 where we start with a review of example two. We look at the answer and work through that. So it was a little bit of a homework between lecture 9.2 and 9.3. And again, as we mentioned for Finance Act 21, for our 21-22 tax year, the official rate of interest to use in answering a part of that question is 2% and not 2.25%. In example three, within this particular lecture as well. The lecture requires the answer for 2021, whereas of course we are working with our FA 2021 study notes and we want 2122. But the computations remain the same. There's no difference in the calculations you do. It's just a different tax year. The lectures show 2021, our notes show what we need to be doing it for and we'll be required to do it for 2122 but there's no difference in terms of the calculations done. It's then when we get to the last two lectures, 9.4 and 9.5 here, that we've got newly recorded lectures using the information and using the study notes that are well, in front of you now relevant to Finance Act 2021. And as I said in my introduction, it's basically to do with cars, where the benefits that are accessible in relation to cars the principles and rules haven't changed, but the numbers have. We've got different percentages for different level of CO2 emissions. So that's changed, which would make it impossible when all of this is computational, because everything that we need to know is actually provided to us in the exam room on the rates and allowances page. What we've got to know is how to use that information for our tax year and compute the accessible benefit in relation to a motor car. And indeed, not just for the car itself, but also if the employer pays for any part of the private fuel of the employee in relation to their private motoring, then there will also be a fuel benefit. There's a couple of other little benefits in there as well, where again, one or two changes have occurred that necessitate, therefore, sadly, not too sad for you, of course, but new lectures will be shown for 9.4 and 9.5. So do please, in relation to, obviously, this lecture is just a continuation of what we have uh, now been saying, and it will roll into lecture 9.1 from FA 2020 in a moment's time. But just remind yourself before 9.2 lecture and 9.3 lecture, to be aware of those changes. You might want to note that in your uh, notes there, ready for those particular lectures. So you don't get confused where in the lecture, I'm talking about a 2.25% calculation, whereas in your study note, it's actually 2%, okay? All right, I'll leave you there for now. Firstly, is this particular lecture, the rest of it, to the old, not that old, the FA 2020 lecture. Well, in the previous five chapters, we've dealt with the complexities, dare I say, of dealing with the unincorporated trader. Now, that unincorporated trader, it could be a sole trader, it could be a partnership. What do we have to do? We had to sort out to begin with on what figure of trading income, trading profit there made by the business, what amount of that profit would be chargeable to tax, the adjustment of profit process which in itself involved the computation and deduction of capital allowances. We would establish a tax-adjusted trading profit in that way for an accounting period. We had a problem. We then had to relate that accounting period to the tax year in which that profit would be assessed. 
And in chapter six, we looked at all the ways by which we would deal with that relationship, that matching of a period of profit to a tax year in which that profit would be assessed. We looked at our bases of assessment and we had particular enjoyment, I'm sure you'd agree there, dealing with the situations of opening years in particular and also then in closing years. We then moved our attention to say, well, not always when you're self-employed are you fortunate enough to make a profit. You may incur a loss. So what loss reliefs are available? And if the business you're dealing with isn't just the sole trader, so all of the profit, all of the loss belongs to that one person and may be dealt with within the realm of their own individual income tax computation. If it's a partnership, then an initial exercise that must be done, having got that tax adjusted trading profit of the partnership, was to split it between the partners. And that split was a very sensible split. We just split it according to whatever the profit sharing agreement was in force during the accounting period in which the profit was made. In that way, for any given accounting period, we could establish how much profit or indeed, though we wouldn't have to do it, how much loss was available to each of those partners and then deal with them like any other sole trader. Well, having spent five chapters doing this, we now have the second major form of earned income that we would see. And of course, the one that is most typical within most economies, and that is employment income. There are far more employed persons than there will be self-employed in most economies. And certainly that is true of the UK. Now, we've only got one chapter on employment income. So that's good news in itself. But it's a substantial chapter all the same. Not only is it substantial, it's vital. Again, it is most likely that somewhere either in section A for one or more objective testing questions, there may be an issue that involves employment income assessment. Or it could be in section C in a written question. We're dealing with an employee and we have to establish what employment income assessment they had and put that with other sources of income onto, as we know, the income tax computation and compute the tax liability of the individual. Now, all we've seen so far and back in chapter two was salary. Employment income was your salary. It was your cash remuneration and it was in gross form. We learned in chapter two that the employee wouldn't actually be paid in their pay packet or transferred into their bank account at the end of each month there. There were, if it was a, like a salary earner paid on a monthly basis, they wouldn't receive one twelfth of their gross salary each month. What they would get is their net salary. And that gross salary, one twelfth of whatever the gross annual remuneration may be, that monthly figure would then be subjected to income tax being deducted at source through the pay as you earn system, P-A-Y-E. And though we haven't yet dealt with it, it uh, awaits us in chapter 11. We are aware of the term national insurance contributions. There will also be national in insurance contributions to pay in relation to that salary, that employment income. But what we're going to discover in this chapter is how the employment income assessment is going to be much more than a single figure of annual salary that was given to us as it was in chapter two. What we will see is that that employment income is going to be made up of a number of things. Certainly at the heart of it, and to be fair, the vast majority of employees only have this one thing, which is their salary. Their uh, wages each week, their salary each month, it is their annual salary. That is what they are able to benefit from. That's what their employer pays to them. That is how the employer chooses to remunerate the employee. But in bigger and better questions involving employees in our exam, we're going to see a much more interesting employee. One who has more than just cash remuneration. More than indeed just cash remuneration and where that cash remuneration may be in different forms. We may indeed have a salary. But if you're a sales uh, department executive, then you may get sales commission, a further cash remuneration. Whoever you are, whichever department you work in, the employer 
may run a bonus scheme. Now that could be linked to your performance, your department's performance. It may be to the general performance of the company overall. So again, a further cash amount is paid out to you. So we could see not just your basic salary, but we could see sales commissions paid to salespersons, of course, there, and bonuses paid to any employees, all different forms of cash remuneration. But it doesn't stop there. If it was only cash, your remuneration, your salary, your wage that was assessed to tax, then it would be very easy to get around the scope of income tax in relation to what you took from your employer. That you would have a salary package, an employment income package, that involved not just the cash remuneration that you knew each week, each month would go through the PAYE system and have tax and indeed national insurance contributions deducted at source there. That what you could then do is to say to an employer, look, don't pay me all of my monthly salary. Let's say I've got an annual salary of £36,000, £3,000 a month. Don't pay me a gross £3,000 because all of that then, subject to my personal allowance, of course, is going to be chargeable to tax. I tell you what, instead, you pay my mortgage interest. You pay my supermarket bills. You pay all of my travel expenses. You buy this for me. You buy that for me. And then what's left over, you pay me that. Now, clearly, if that is the situation, all those things, those benefits that the employer is providing to you, in addition to just the cash remuneration, have got to be dealt with somehow, somewhere within the income tax system. Otherwise, it would be way too easy to avoid income tax in relation to your employment there. So, again, think about what benefits you might like to have. Now, I've just listed off a few things that the company may pay, the employer may pay on your behalf. But things, what else would you like other than an obscenely large salary, of course? Well, what you might like is, well, a company car. Again, I keep saying company there self-employed will also employ their own employees. So this is applicable to all employees. But the classic one is, of course, that the company or the employer provides a company car there. So you get your car provided to you. Otherwise, that would be a very significant amount of expenditure that you would need to incur. Not only do you get the car, but you get the fuel. So expensive these days until electric takes over, of course. But the diesel, the petrol, very expensive, so the company pays for that. Your employer pays for it. Now then, you use that to go to work and back each day. And you go home at the end of the day and you open the door on what is a company-owned house. They've provided you with living accommodation. Or indeed, they've paid your mortgage for your own accommodation. What you'll find in our exam questions is the company owns this residential property and the employee is provided with the use of that property. There has clearly got to be, for the car, for the fuel, for the property, some sort of assessment that will arise. But of course, that then means we've got to come up with some system of doing that. How can we do that? It'd be easy with... If the company was paying your mortgage interest, that's a cash payment. What is the cost to the employer? That is an assessable benefit. It is as if you were paid that amount. They have just paid it to the, your mortgage company instead. So when they're paying, buying something like that, that expense incurred, it's very easy to establish what the assessable benefit would be, the cost to the employer. But what about with a car? they buy you a £30,000 car for your use, are you going to be assessed on 30000 Well, no, that wouldn't be fair to have one huge, great figure just based on that cost there incurred. So they have a very specific way, a very detailed way, by which they assess an assessable car benefit. And that, again, like with living accommodation, awaits us a little later there. So there's all sorts of expenses that could be 
paid for by the employer as a benefit to the employee. Now, the vast majority of these benefits are taxable. They are assessable benefits. But surprisingly, it might sound, there are some indeed, not a huge amount, but there are some benefits that are exempt. Clearly, something that employee may wish to take advantage of if the employer is happy enough to provide them with those particular benefits. So a lot of the work that we do here in this chapter is all involved in finding out what the original gross amount of employment income will be. It's easy with your annual salary. All I may do there is to say that the salary uh, was payable in relation to the accounting year, the 1st of January to the businesses, the companies, the employers accounting year end 31st of December. So if we therefore have to work out what is going to be assessed as employment income on the employee for our 2020-21 tax year, that goes 6th of April to 5th of April. We do our apportionments, of course, to the nearest month again. So that means that for the 2021 tax year, with salary linked to the company's year end, and no doubt going up from 2020 into 2021, then the 2021 tax year with the year ended 31st of December is nine months, nine twelfths of the annual salary for 2020 and three twelfths of the annual salary there for 2021. So it's an easy apportionment. In terms of bonuses or commissions, we'll talk about again effectively when those are received we'll look at the precise wording for what we mean by received in just a short while. And then, of course, on top of all of that, we've then got to establish what those benefits are. We may have in a question a list of what the employer provides to the employee. Some of those may be exempt, so hopefully quickly and easily dealt with. But you've got to recognise that they are on your list of exempt benefits. And I'm afraid here there's going to be quite a few lists, a lot of things to learn. Some of what we do in this chapter is made easier from the information provided for you on your rates and allowances pages on your computer in the exam. So you don't have to learn everything, but there is still a significant amount of learning to go on, a substantial amount of which we'll be talking about indeed in this first lecture on employment income. Once you've got the overall gross amount of employment income, the salaries, the commissions, the bonuses, the assessable benefits, either just what the company is, your employer has paid to the provider of that benefit to, uh, for you there. They paid your supermarket bills, they paid your mortgage interest, whatever. Once we've established all of those amounts of cash, rem of cash remuneration paid, and the amounts actually paid to providers of the benefit, as we said, like the mortgage company there, like the supermarket. Once we've added in all of the other benefits where there's a very specific method of computing that benefit that we, of course, have to learn, as it is with living accommodation, as it is with cars and fuel, as it is with other assets made available for private use there. Once we've sorted all of that out, there is still a further process that needs to be undertaken. Because away from that gross amount of assessment so far, we will be allowed to deduct allowable expenses that we incur. If you as the employee incur expenses that are allowable expenses, then that is a deduction that will be deducted in deriving the net employment income assessment to then include on your income tax computation. For us, of course, it's the 2021 tax year for that 2020-21 income tax computation. So we need to put together those things, building from your basic salary, adding in all the assessable benefits, be they simple, that amount paid by the employer, that cost to the employer is the accessible benefit. Or more complex, there was this particular car made available for your use during the tax year. There was this particular other asset made available for your use. 
living accommodation, the furniture and furnishings within that living accommodation, etc., etc. There has to be a way of establishing a financial f figure and an amount of money, a figure to include on your income tax computation. And then we've got to look at the expenses incurred. Now, we had this issue about allowable expenses in a big, big way in relation to the self-employed. We had to look at the and disallow the non-allowable expenses in that adjustment of profit process. And so it will be here that we need to learn which expenses will be allowable and which ones will not be allowable in relation to what you have incurred. In terms of the self-employed, you will remember, I hope, the basic general overall rule for allowability of expenses in determining the trading income assessment for the self-employed. That was that expenses should be incurred wholly and exclusively for the purpose of the trade. You might thought that was difficult enough. It is even more difficult to get expenses allowable against your employment income because now those expenses must be incurred not just wholly and exclusively in the performance of your employment, but also and necessarily. So we have wholly, exclusively and necessarily in the performance of the duties of employment. Now, don't worry, those rules, all these issues are coming up later in these notes. There's no need for you to quickly write that down. But again, something you will need to know. The basic allowable deductions to be an allowable expense, it must be incurred by the employee wholly, exclusively and necessarily incurred in the performance of the duties of employment. So it's about putting all of those things together. Now I've contrasted there the self-employed that we spent those previous five chapters looking at with now employment and the employed. And what we'll have is an initial distinction of, again, in most senses you'll be thinking, well, it's pretty obvious, isn't it, whether you're self-employed or whether you're an employee. There are gray areas. So what we have are rules that would determine whether an individual is likely to, and then HMRC will determine this, to be treated as self-employed or as an employee. We won't know this in full as yet, but based on what I've just said, it is more difficult for an employee to gain relief for allowable expenses than it is for the self-employed. There, therefore, is a reason why an individual, if they had a choice, would prefer to be treated as self-employed rather than an employee of the business for which they do work. We don't know this one yet, but in terms of national insurance contributions, there is a lower level of national insurance contribution that is paid uh, by the self-employed, the main rate that they pay is lower than that which it is for the employee. So there's another reason why you'd prefer to be classified as self-employed. And also then, again, you don't know about this at the moment, but if you have to pay tax, when do you want to pay it? Well, you'd like to pay it as late as possible without, of course, incurring any penalties or interest on overdue tax. With employment income, with your basic salary or wage that you paid, there is no time lag at all between you making that, earning that salary, receiving that salary, and you pay your tax. Each week or each month, wage or salary, you get a net figure after the employer has done, as it were, the dirty work, don't call it this in the exam, of Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs and collected that tax at source on behalf of HMRC. And again, then on a regular basis, they will pay over all the tax that they've collected from their employees in relation to their specific levels of salary. And they pay that over to HMRC. It's a very good system for HMRC. They don't have to go chase every employee for the amount of tax that they owe. They get the employer to do that job for them and that's why we have the pay-as-you-earn system. In terms of self-employed, you don't yet know when you pay your tax for the self-employed. But clearly, there's no intermediary there to do the job of Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs for them. 
So they will assess you directly in relation to your trading income. It is known as self-assessment. The individual, their responsibility is not to wait for HMRC to chase them for some tax for the profit they've made for any given period. It is their responsibility under self-assessment to disclose that information to HMRC, the details of which you will see indeed in Chapter 15, the Administration Chapter. Suffice it at this point to say that you've got a lot more time between making the profit and getting your hands on the cash that that profit creates for you, you've got a lot more time as a self-employed person between making that profit, receiving that cash, and then having to pay any tax in relation to that profit figure. With the employee, there is no time at all. HMRC have had their share both in terms of income tax and NICs, national insurance contributions, before you get yours. You pick up a net figure there. So good reasons why an individual may prefer to be treated as self-employed, but why HMRC may very well prefer for that individual to be treated as an employee. So what we see is that there are tests, therefore, that determine whether or not an individual is employed. Now, again, it's something at this stage in your studies, assuming we're not here at this stage in your individual studies, very close to the exam, I hope not. But this is not something that you sit down and attempt to learn at this point in time. You familiarise yourself with the context that there are tests that determine whether or not someone is an employee or self-employed. That is just a, a very much a learning exercise and is something that can be done closer to the exam date. But let's now look at the content of the chapter and put some meat upon the bones of what I've outlined uh, represent our tasks for this particular chapter in dealing with employment income, at least so far as your exam is concerned. So here to begin with in chapter nine, we've got the scope of employment income. And of course, as we have said, it's going to be an employee who is taxable under and using employment income rules. And of course, the self-employed person will now be taxed, taxed as an unincorporated trader under the rules for trading income. So how do we differentiate between employment or self-employment? Well, we've got some principles here that need to be looked at in deciding, making that call between whether someone is indeed to be treated as an employee or as self-employed. We've got one basic overall test that is vital and something you should be aware of from that, right from the word go. The main test of an employment as opposed to self-employment is the existence of a, now note that word or those words, a contract of service, a contract of service. That is an employee compared with, for the self-employed, a contract for the services that you perform. So there you go, there you've got your basic distinction. If what you have is a contract of service, you are an employee and will be dealt with in the way that you'll see in this chapter. If it's a contract for services, then as we've dealt with in the last previous five chapters there, we know how to establish the trading income for such an individual and how and when that income will be assessed to taxation. So contract of service, contract for service. If there is no specific contract of service, most employees will have an employment contract there. So it is an easy call to make. Are you or are you not an employee? The following would suggest employment. Now, you're never going to get a situation where there'll be a tick next to all of these and therefore, well, yeah, you're an employee, therefore. What we will find in reality is we have to look at it on a balanced basis. On the balance of the things that you find, read the questions that we're about to ask, is that individual self-employed or employed? Now, we're not interested in the theory, you're interested in how is this going to be assessed to uh, in the exam? How are you going to be tested on it? 
And what you could get here is a section A objective testing question, whereby they list out four specific issues, some of which will be taken from there and ask how, which ones of those or how many of them represent a contract of service. What would make that employment? And you've got to pick out the ones that are either say, yes, this individual is an employee or no, this information suggests that they're self-employed. It could, of course, just be a discursive issue within a section C question. So what tests do they apply? If there is an obligation by the employer to offer work, an obligation by the employee to undertake the work offered. An employee would not normally be in a position to decline work when offered. An employer doesn't normally call you up each day and say, is it OK for you to come into work each day? There is an expectation, there is a requirement for you to come into work each day. If you are ringing up someone who is self-employed, you will ask them, when are you available to come in? Are you able to do this? Do you want to do this job? There's a distinction there quite clearly. The employer controls the manner and method of the work. This is what you do. This is how you do it. Nothing is left to that employee, as it were, in the context of what they choose to do. It is, this is your job. This is what you are required to do. It doesn't mean, of course, that they can't then think for themselves. Of course they are. But the parameters of their employment will be laid down. The employee is entitled to benefits normally provided to employees, such as sick pay and holiday pay. If you get those from the person employing you, you are an employee. If you don't have anything like that, then maybe you're not an employee. Maybe you are self-employed. The employees committed to work a specified number of hours at certain fixed times and is paid by the hour, the week or the month. Again, the employer has control over when you work, what work you do. It's not up to you to decide whether or not you're going on this particular day. And they tend to be longer term. If this is just something that has happened with a business for one week in the year, then that is not going to be employment there. So the engagement is for a long period of time. If you're an employee, you should be provided with the equipment needed to do the job. So an employee does not provide his own equipment. Self-employed, they will bring along what tools, whatever it is they need to perform the job that they have been asked to do. The employee is obliged to work personally and exclusively for the employer and cannot hire his own helpers. So when you have an employee, it is that specific individual is required to do, come and do the work. That individual can't ring up their employer one day and say, look, uh, I'm going away for a couple of days, but don't worry, I found somebody else to come in and they will do my job. That's not going to happen. If you are self-employed, then, depending on what you put into a contract with the uh, uh, client there for your services, there is simply you will provide someone, not necessarily you personally, to do the job that is required to be done. There is therefore, again, a difference between employment and self-employment. The work performed by the employee is an integral part of the business of the employer and not merely an accessory to it. Again, somewhat peripheral there and not usually an issue. Again, more general items and terms. The economic reality of self-employment is missing, namely the financial risk arising from not being paid and an agreed or regular remuneration. If you've got a job, you are an employee, then you have a weekly wage, a monthly salary there, one twelfth of your annual. There is no financial risk in doing a job. For the self-employed, they may be, they say, right, uh, I will do this job for this amount. Now, the question then is, can they do that job for that amount? Does it actually take them more time to do it? They've agreed a particular fee with the client there. That is not something that happens with an employee. And therefore, an employee cannot profit from sound management. 
that's what they get paid, subject, I suppose, to any bonus scheme that might exist, but that's what they are paid. There's nothing there in terms of sound management that somebody who is self-employed thinking, oh yes, we can do it this way, and that therefore will increase the profit that we make on this job. So again, not something for you to sit and learn at this point, but to consider at a later point in time, and when you start to do practice section A questions, and you start to come across these, come back, have a look at your list, think about it, and then apply. And in doing questions, you're more likely to remember how you've applied a particular rule in answering a specific question, rather than just this amorphous list of points that you've seen from your study notes. Accessible emoluments here. There's a lovely term, emoluments. Individuals are assessed on the amount of emoluments received in the tax year. Now, emoluments, that's just this general term for not just your salary or wage or your commissions or your bonuses, but all of your various benefits as well. Individuals assessed on the amount of emoluments received in the tax year. Now, the question is, what do we mean by received? Well, it's the obvious one. When did you actually receive your cash remuneration? When were you paid there? But there is a rule that we need to be aware of here. And the date received for taxation purposes is taken as the earlier of the date when the employee becomes entitled to the payment. There's a form of words that you need to learn the date when the employee became entitled to that payment or the date when it was actually received by the employee. Whichever of those is earlier is the one that we take. As we said a moment ago, what do we mean by emoluments? All of the cash remuneration, your normal wages and salaries there. The one-off payments of a bonus or commission, depending on performance. Um, also, cash amounts paid. And then, of course, we've got the area of assessable benefits. And that one little note there beckons a huge area in terms of <coughs> those list of benefits that are either taxable or exempt. But before we look at those, we deal now with the second aspect, pardon me, <coughs> the second aspect over and above cash remuneration that we said was relevant in our exam, and of course in reality, and that is it's not just talking about what uh, benefits go into making up the overall <coughs> gross employment income figure. It's also about what allowable expenses may be incurred. I'll just take a glass of water at this point in time and I'll be back with you in a moment. OK, hopefully uh, voice restored to its uh, normal working condition. Um, deductibility of expenses from employment income. Uh, we won't deal with these in order, but we'll go to this one here, which is an issue that we already know about. The general rule is that expenses must be incurred wholly, exclusively and necessarily in the performance of the duties of employment. So there we have something that is much a tighter a rule than was for the self-employed, where it was only wholly and exclusively incurred for the business, for the trade there. So those three conditions. So if in doubt, that's what we go back to. But there are certain items that we know to look for and that are more commonly dealt with in terms of real life practice. Firstly, the following expenditure is deductible. Contributions to an approved occupational pension scheme within certain limits, see chapter 10. So if your employer operates what is called, and hence the name, an occupational pension scheme, that word occupational means it's run by the employer, or at least the employer instructs a specialist company to supervise and run this pension scheme on behalf of their employees there. But it is one into which that the employer will contribute. It is also possible that the individual employee 
may be able to voluntarily contribute to that to top up the amount of pension. Again, it is common that in such occupational pension schemes, the employee is allowed, therefore, to top up what the employer pays and put some extra in. That amount might change from one year to another, whatever, but we do get, therefore, the situation of having to deal with both employer contributions, that is where the employer is paying into your pension scheme, and what we're now talking about, where the employee makes contributions into their own uh, pension scheme. So where an employee is a member of the employer's occupational pension scheme, and as normally it would be the case, is allowed to make these voluntary contributions into that scheme, as long as it's an approved occupational scheme, you won't have to know any definition of that, then those amounts paid in will be allowable deductions. What we will see, as this is suggested here, is that there's rather more to deal with, and that's involved in Chapter 10, to determine whether or not all contributions are actually going to achieve effective tax relief for the employee. But that awaits us in our next chapter. What else? Fees and subscriptions to relevant professional bodies. So once, therefore, you've passed all your exams and you join the uh, Association of Chartered and Certi Chartered Certified Accountants there, and you pay to the ACCA your professional subscription, that professional subscription each year will be an allowable deduction. The only issue here is that for these uh, uh, professional fees to be allowable, it's got to be something to do with the job that you are doing there. If you are working in the accountancy field, then that is going to be allowable. Again, it must be relevant to the job that you are doing, which again, you would expect to be the case. We already know that if an individual wishes to gain effective tax relief in relation to a donation to a charity, then the gift aid scheme is available that we looked at and reviewed and dealt with in back in chapter two. Again, you may need to go back and look at that. But what may now happen in addition to or instead of that for any individual employee concerned is that the employer operates here what is known as a payroll deduction scheme, whereby if your monthly gross salary was £3,000, you could say to your employer, if they operated this scheme, that, that you would want them to take out of your gross salary, let's say £100 or whatever figure you choose, and pay that over on that monthly basis to your specific favourite charity or charities. Now, obviously, that involves an amount of work on behalf there of the employer. So it's not all employers who would operate such a system. On that basis, now, what do they always tell you a lot about turning phones off in lectures? Well, not you, of course, but you're not the people in front of me. Well, you are sort of, but I hope, yes. I put my phone in with me. Oops. Apologies. So in relation to this, if the employer operates the payroll deduction scheme, they take a part of the weekly wage or the monthly salary that would have been paid and put through the PAYE system going to the individual and instead redirect that amount of your pay across to the uh, favourite charity or charities. What will happen, therefore, is if you were told, here is the gross salary for the individual, uh, £36,000 per annum, and the individual pays £100 a month through the payroll deduction scheme to charities, then that's £100 a month, 12 months, £1,200. In working out your employment income assessment to put into your income tax computation, you would have Gross salary, £36,000, less contributions to the payroll deduction scheme, 12 times 100, £1,200, and that would be an allowable deduction. In the same way as if you are making contributions into your 
occupational pension scheme run by the employer. Again, that would be taken out at source by the employer. So you say, I want 4% of my annual salary there uh, each month to be paid to, into my own uh, pension fund, operated, of course, by the employer's occupational pension scheme. Again, 4% of 36,000 in my example, whatever that comes to. Uh, what's about 1,440 or something like that? Anyway, whatever the figure is there, uh, that would be an, an allowable deduction to go against that employment income of £36,000. That gross figure, take away the contributions to the pension scheme, take away the charitable contributions through the payroll deduction scheme. What we may also have is travel expenses that we've incurred necessarily in the performance of the duties of employment. Now, what you'd normally expect to see is if you were incurring such travel expenses to allow you then to do that particular job, that the employer would uh, potentially reimburse you for that uh, travel expense incurred. So you work in a firm of uh, chartered certified accountants and you go out and visit clients. And when you go out and visit clients, you uh, again incur travel expenses. Well, you therefore will put in an expense claim each week, each month there for the expenses that you have incurred. And so you get your money back. But if you didn't get your money back, if there was, there was no reimbursement here, then this is an allowable deduction if you've incurred those travel expenses. Now, those travel expenses, as we will see just a little bit later, well, in the next lecture together, in all honesty, those travel expenses that are allowable deductions from your employment income do not include simply you going from home to work. Home to work is not an allowable expense. That travel is incurred simply to allow you to do your job. That therefore is private. It is personal. It is not an allowable travel expense in relation to you then. For example, as we've just said, being required to go off and visit a client and that client is 20 miles away and you get on the train and you pay for your train ticket and that therefore would be an allowable expense. Normally, as I say, in reality, that would be reimbursed. So what goes in would also come out. But if you're told these are travel expenses incurred in performing that job, not in allowing you to go to where you simply perform that job, then those would be allowable deductions. But more of those next time, uh, not least when you use your own car. And you can see that one coming up. But that again will be next time. Last one on this list. Uh, capital allowances are available for plant and machinery provided by an employee for use in his duties. Now, one of the tests of employment was that any plant and machinery would be, any equipment would be provided to you. So it would be unusual, shall we say here, but it does happen in certain trades where the individual is expected to provide their, that provide their own specific equipment. If that is the case, as it says here, then that individual employee, in relation to that expenditure incurred, can claim capital allowances, which would almost inevitably mean there they were just getting 100% AIA available in relation to that expenditure. OK, well, we've had an introduction there to what uh, we're going to have to deal with in terms of employment income. And to repeat, that is all about finding out what constitutes employment income. It isn't just remuneration. It is most specifically benefits, most of which will be taxable, some of which, as we'll see next time, are exempt. That's going to be another learning exercise. And having established the overall gross amount of employment income upon which we are chargeable to tax, what then are any allowable expenses that we, the employee, incur out of our own pockets and are therefore able to deduct in deriving the net employment income assessment? So plenty more for us to consider in what will be, well, not just one additional lecture on this chapter, but there's going to be probably two or three more lectures in relation to this chapter. So lots to look forward to there.